January of last year, Dave Thomas, founder and spokesperson of Wendy's Hamburger fast food chain, died. He was 69 years old. You know, the average life expectancy in the United States is 77. Wendy's spokespersons, however, denied any relationship between the bacon double cheeseburgers, another fast food fare he hawked on television, and his earlier uh, near-fatal heart attack or his earlier quadruple bypass operation. Every minute, an American clutches at their chest in terror and keels over dead from a heart attack. Strikes down half a million Americans every year. Heart disease has been the number one cause of death for men and women in this country every single year for the last seven decades. The number one cause of death in these United States. And soon, thanks to the export of our diet around the world, sought to be the number one cause of death in the world soon. Now contrast Dave Thomas with Jay Dinshaw, founder and spokesperson of the American Vegan Society. Just a tireless advocate for the animals, a true inspiration. But I never got to meet him because he died too, apparently of a heart attack. He was 66 years old. What? Died of a heart attack? How? Never ate a burger in his life. Raised vegetarian vegan for 40 years. Made me stop, gave me pause. Went, got my cholesterol checked, and you know, wanted to head over to the medical library to see if there's anything new in the medical literature that could help me explain Jay's death. I mean, last time I checked, we were doing pretty good. I mean, was Jay's death just a fluke? So this talk is a product of that review. I started by looking at mortality rates, comparing the death rates of meat eaters to vegetarians to vegans. Vegans are vegetarians that strive to exclude all animal products from their diet, including eggs and dairy, most often for animal suffering concerns. Well, if you look back at the vegetarian literature, you'll see all sorts of kind of circumstantial evidence based on kind of indirect guesses as to how we as vegetarians were doing. So you could point to research that said that, for example, those that ate lots of fruits and vegetables live longer, and hey, we eat lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, it's not actually the same thing as following real live vegetarians and vegans. I mean, what we'd like someone to do is take a few thousand of us, follow us out for a few years, and kind of see how we do. Now, one could make guesses as to what one might find if someone did something like that. Take, say, our cholesterol levels, for example. We've known for over 50 years that vegetarians have much lower cholesterol levels than meat eaters. Based on those levels, vegetarians should have maybe half the heart disease mortality that meat eaters do, and vegans should have practically none. But is that true? Again, we really didn't know. Um, but, I mean, sounds good to me. I mean, after all, cholesterol is the single biggest risk factor for heart disease, and hey, we've got the lowest cholesterol, right? And I don't think a rocket scientist kind of figure it all out. Unless, of course, there was some kind of adverse effect of vegetarianism somehow counterbalancing our low risk, but otherwise, we should be just cruising. Well, let's think of some of the other risk factors for heart disease. Cholesterol, we've got less cholesterol. Obesity, we've got less obesity. Diabetes, we've got less diabetes. Hypertension, we've got less hypertension. We eat more soy, more fiber, more antioxidants, less animal protein, and hey, don't we have lower stroke rates and cancer rates too? We should just be kicking tush in the whole mortality department. So anyway, I got this email from FARM, the Farm Animal Reform Movement, an animal rights group in Washington, D.C., and they were compiling their annual table of American deaths for which the consumption of animal products represent a substantial contributing factor. And so they asked my medical opinion as to exactly which diseases those were. So I said, aha, finally, a chance to go to the, to the medical library and, and see if indeed there's anything new that could help 
explain Jay's death to answer that nagging question about Jay Dinshaw that continued to haunt me. Now, whenever I take on a new research project, the first thing I do is look at the latest research, which is what I'd like to share with everyone today. So I went to Harvard's medical library, probably the best in the world, half expecting more estimates, more guesses as to how we as vegetarians were doing. Little did I know we had real data now, actual studies that took thousands of vegetarians and followed them out for years. So finally, real data, the latest data on vegetarian mortality rates. Ah, I was like drooling, right? finally. Maybe we were doing even better than our estimates, right? All right, well, this is what I've been waiting for. A study of 8,000 vegetarians followed for 18 years. Ooh. I didn't wait to go back to my seat, didn't wait to go home. I just stood there in the newly received journal section. I, this was just published last year, 2002, and read it. I stood there and my jaw dropped. Stunned into silence, shocked at what I saw. They reported no difference between the mortality rates of meat eaters compared to the mortality rates of vegetarians. No difference. But wait a second, it doesn't make any sense. What are the top three killers in the US? Heart disease, cancer, stroke. How could we be dying at the same rate as meat eaters? It doesn't make any sense. Well, there are three findings I'd like to investigate with everyone today. And that's finding number one. Why? Do meat eaters seem to live just as long as vegetarians? And not only did vegetarians not seem to live longer, they had basically the same cancer death rates too, the same number of colon cancer deaths, the same fatal stroke rate, and, and this is what I've been worried about, the same rates of fatal heart disease. They found no difference in the risk of dying from a heart attack between those that ate meat and those that didn't eat meat. What are you saying? Doesn't that go against everything we know, though? Right? What about our cholesterol? What's counteracting all of our natural potential as vegetarians? Right? Now, we don't have more heart disease than meat eaters, but certainly more than we should. Right? So I went down the list of mortality rates for all the other diseases. Same mortality rates from stroke, heart disease, same, 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 same difference, same difference, same, 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 same. Okay, well, at least out of the list of the top dozen or so things people die from, there were at least two classes of diseases for which the mortality rates were significantly different between vegetarians and meat eaters. Unfortunately, they were not in our favor. Some of the data suggested that vegetarians seem to have a 50% greater risk of dying from breast cancer, for example. But that was explained away by the fact that vegetarians tend to have less children, which is a well-known risk factor for breast cancer. So vegetarianism probably has nothing to do with breast cancer mortality. I just want to make that clear. But the second finding is less easy to explain away. They found that vegetarians had over twice the risk of dying from degenerative brain diseases, like Alzheimer's disease. What? Well, first of all, the fact that the only two differences were more vegetarian deaths, that's upsetting in itself. But what's this about vegetarians having twice the risk of dying from mental and neurological disease? I mean, when I first saw this, I said, I mean, these have just got to be some kind of weird, random flukes, right? Because it doesn't make any sense. Well, this is the latest published results. But, you know, it actually takes like a year to go to publication. So these, this data is like years old by now. You know, every five years, all the experts on vegetarian nutrition get together and hold an international congress on vegetarian nutrition. And the last one was, hey, just last year, April 2002, hey, hey, hey. So is there anything new under the vegetarian sun? Yes, indeed. Preliminary results from a study were released twice the size, 17,000 vegetarians. 
this so-called EPIC study out of Europe, started in 1993. So we had been waiting almost 10 years for results to start trickling out. Well, last year, they trickle. Ready for the results? Once again, vegetarians had the same mortality rates as meat eaters, I mean, confirming the other study. Right? Okay, but what about this? What about the brain disease thing? I mean, that has just got to be some kind of weird fluke. Sadly, no. There was only one significant difference this time between the mortality rates of vegetarians and meat eaters, and that was that vegetarians had a 50% greater risk of dying from brain disorder. Now, right now, all the smug vegans in the room are thinking, I know what's going on, right? Isn't milk just liquid meat? Right? All that saturated fat and cholesterol. And indeed, dairy is the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet. Right? And aren't eggs like little cholesterol bombs? No wonder they're not doing so hot. Right? They're dragging down the average, right? Separate out the vegans, and then you'll see a little longevity, baby, you know? Well, unfortunately, neither of these two studies separated out the vegans. All right, so where can we turn? Well, this is the latest re research, both published and unpublished. What about the best? Well, you know, the best research we have today is probably this study, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, called Mortality in Vegetarians and Non-Vegetarians. And what these 12 researchers did was took all the biggest and best studies to date and kind of pooled all the data together. So. They took a decade of mortality data from 28,000 vegetarians from Germany, the UK, and California and found no survival advantage for vegetarians. What about vegans, though? We don't need all that cheesy crap, and we have even lower, more, lower cholesterol levels, right? Vegans didn't live any longer either. Same mortality rates as meat eaters. Wow, there must be something really working against vegans if we can die those kind of heart disease rates with such low, low cholesterol levels. Right? Now, this isn't the end-all, be-all, though it had 28,000 vegetarians, only had a few hundred vegans. This new EPIC study out of Europe has thousands of vegans who will become the best, soon become the best study on vegans in human history. Unfortunately, having seen the, some of the preliminary data and spoken to the principal investigators over there, there's no reason to suspect that the results will come out any different than what we see right here. And in fact, just last month, uh, the results from the famous German Heidelberg study were released. 2,000 people followed for 21 years and the vegetarians lived longer than the vegans. And those who ate meat on occasion outlasted them all. All right, before I go about exploring these findings, I would just like to uh, throw up a third finding I'd like to investigate today, and throw up is right. <laughs> Osteoporosis has reached epidemic levels in this country. 10 million Americans, particularly women, suffer from this disease. Now, if you compare the bone mineral density of vegetarians to meat eaters, it's about the same. Now, in some studies, the bone mineral density of vegans has not been as good, but you know, that's just, bone mineral density is only one indicator of bone health. What you also want to know is if someone's actually more likely to break something. So, hip fracture rate has been considered kind of like the gold standard um, in terms of an indicator for bone health. But since there's never been any studies on hip fracture rates in vegetarians, I don't think we can cl conclusively say much about vegetarian bone health. Again, we could estimate, right, based on bone mineral density, we're probably doing pretty good. But again, we didn't have any studies on hip fracture rates in vegetarians until now. Presented for the first time to the Congress last year in a study of thousands of California Seventh-day Adventists, Vegetarians had over twice the hip fracture rate as meat eaters. So this is the third finding I'd like to investigate with everyone today. Let's start with this, the first finding about longevity, right? Now, this isn't to say we couldn't necessarily live longer, right? Remember our cholesterol levels, our blood pressure and all that. We have a tremendous potential for decreasing heart disease risk, but something is getting in our way. 
What is it about vegetarian and vegan diets that's increasing our risk of dying so much that it's counteracting kind of all of our natural benefits? Right? What is it? And just as importantly, can we change it? And the good news is, about time for some good news, and the good news is, is that yes, we think we know exactly what's going on, and yes, with but a few simple changes, not only will we reclaim all of our natural vegetarian advantages, but we may surpass our highest expectations. Turns out there are two major things about vegetarian diets, and we are going to nail both of them today. As an aside, though, I mean, just because we don't seem to live longer, even as we are, no, even our, as we are now with no changes, just because vegetarians don't seem to live longer doesn't mean they're not healthier. I mean, vegetarians do have lower rates of obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, you know, colon cancer, heart disease, appendicitis, the list goes on and on. So it still makes sense to go vegetarian, even if just for health reasons alone. So it still makes sense to go vegetarian, even if just for health reasons alone. But, you know, you'd think with all that, we'd have some kind of survival advantage, right? What is it about vegetarian, and particularly vegan diets, is increasing our risk so much, it's canceling out our potential? What are we lacking in our diets? What are we deficient in? Well, to begin our detective story quest, one might start thinking, well, what other risk factors are there besides, you know, cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, all that, because we're kicking, tushing all those. Well, to answer that question, one might ask, well, what interventions have been shown to decrease heart disease risk, right? Not eating meat didn't seem to help much, so what has been shown to help? Well, if you take people who've already had a heart attack and therefore at high risk of having another one, and you put them on cholesterol-lowering drugs, their risk of subsequently having another heart attack and dying drops by about 20%. Right? Yeah, but for those at high risk, high risk minus 20% is still high risk. So then they gave people fish oil capsules, eh, dropped their risk of subsequently dying by about 30%. Not bad, but let's just cut to the chase here. I mean, like, what's the best results anyone's ever gotten? Well, there was this one study in which heart disease mortality dropped over 70%. Cancer death rates were cut in half, too. What did they do? Researchers were sitting around one day in France looking at heart disease data, evidently something researchers do in France. They were looking at a graph of heart disease mortality versus cholesterol levels. And not surprisingly, the graph looked like this. Right? The more cholesterol you have in your blood, the higher your risk of dying from heart disease. We've known about this forever, right? So let's say this is data from the United States. Now, but when you did this exact same thing, but charted people who lived in the Mediterranean region of Europe, you got a different graph. You got this. Now, notice same relationship, right? I mean, the more cholesterol you have in your blood, the higher your risk of dying from heart disease. But check this out. At the exact same cholesterol level, those living in southern Europe around the Mediterranean have much lower rates of heart disease. Hmm, well, that's kind of weird. So, the, so they said, what the heck? I, know, I say what the heck in French. But they took these 600 heart patients and put half of them on a Mediterranean diet and put the other half on a so-called uh, American Heart Association strict, prudent, step two diet in what was become known as the famous Lyon Diet Heart Trial. After just two years, the survival benefit was so extreme in the Mediterranean group that they had to stop the study prematurely. An ethics committee came in and said it was just too unethical to keep feeding people the American Heart Association diet because there were so many more deaths in that group. And the results appeared quick, too, the survival advantage. After just one year, you could already see the results, whereas in those cholesterol-lowering drug trials, it took like three to four years to get that wimpy little 20% benefit. And now, after two years, 70% drop in cardiac mortality? Wow. All right, so researchers took blood from everyone, 
uh, analyze their diets, trying to find out what it was about this diet that had such a magical effect. So we have the uh, Mediterranean group. and the control group. So well, the first thing they did was looked at cholesterol levels. Right? After all, cholesterol is the single biggest risk factor for our heart disease and found that after two years on this American Heart Association diet, their average cholesterol was 239. What's your cholesterol supposed to be? A lot less than that, absolutely. Whereas in the Mediterranean group, after two years on the Mediterranean diet, their average cholesterol was 239. Exactly the same. Wait a second, 70% less cardiac mortality in the exact same miserable cholesterol? What's going on? So they looked at everyone's diet. What were these people eating? Right? Was the Mediterranean group eating a lot more fish or something? Isn't that supposed to be good for your heart? Well, no. The Mediterranean group was not eating significantly more fish. What they were eating more of, they were eating more fruits, more vegetables, more beans, more whole grains, less meat. Well, you know, wait a second. We do that. We don't have 70% less cardiac mortality. What's the deal? Well, digging a little deeper, they think they've found the deal. One of the most significant differences between the Mediterranean group and the control group was what's called an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. The omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of the control group was 20, and the Mediterranean group, it was 4. All right. All right. Well, what's an omega-6, what's an omega-3, and why does the ratio make any difference? Well, fats and oils are made up of constituents called fatty acids. And you know there are three types of fatty acids. There are the so-called saturated fats. And you know the saturated fats are what's found. Um, these are fats are solid at room temperature. So these are like lard, tallow, the animal butter fat. These are the animal fats. And also some of the tropical oils like coconut oil and palm kernel oil. And these are bad for you. Bad. Right. And the second, type of the second type of fatty acids are the so-called monounsaturated fats. And you know, monounsaturated fats are what's found in nuts, avocados, olive oil, and canola oil. And these are uh, uh, liquid at room temperature, kind of semi-solid in the fridge. You know how your olive oil gets a little semi-solid in the fridge. And then the third type are the so-called polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are liquid at both room temperature and in the fridge. And you know there are two types of polyunsaturated fatty acids, the so-called omega-3s and the omega-6s. Omega-3s are found in dark leafy greens, walnuts, hemp seeds, flax seeds, and flaxseed oil. Omega-6s on the other found, on the other hand, are found predominantly in cottonseed oil. corn oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil. Now to understand why this ratio makes any difference, we must take a quick diversion into the making of a heart attack. 
we all start out with wonderfully healthy coronary arteries when we're born. And the reason why coronary arteries are so important is because they supply the very blood supply to our heart muscle to allow it to pump. But then for some reason, the inner lining of our arteries gets injured. And that injury can lead to inflammation. And that inflamed area of the arteries can lead to the buildup of oxidized cholesterol. And so inflammation is called the so-called fatty streak stage of atherosclerosis. And that buildup of oxidized cholesterol is the so-called atherosclerotic plaque stage. And that plaque can burst, forming a clot in your coronary arteries, cutting off the blood supply to a region of your heart. And that can lead to sudden death, a fatal heart rhythm, or just damage your heart and set you up for another heart attack or heart failure or all such of other terrible things. Now, up until now, all the attention has been focused on this stage. You know, the buildup of oxidized cholesterol. And you know, that's the stage we rock at. Not only do we have much lower cholesterol levels, but because of all the antioxidants we eat in our fruits and vegetables, we keep what little cholesterol we do have from getting oxidized. Okay? But what about all these other stages? That's where omega-3s come in. There is an enzyme in our body that converts the omega-3s we eat to a, ma a magical substance called EPA. And some of that EPA goes on to produce magical substance number two called DHA. Monounsaturated fats are good for you. These are great. What's so great about these things? Well, they block the inflammation stage. They even block the clot formation stage. They even block this whole sudden death thing. No wonder they're so great. Omega-6s, on the other hand, use this exact same enzyme to produce a substance called AA. And you know, AA is not so great. But you know, we need both of these in our diet, omega-3s and omega-6s, because these are the so-called essential fatty acids, meaning our bodies can't make them. We need to take them into our diets. Now, up until 100 years ago, our bodies, we've been eating about roughly equal amounts of omega-3s and omega-6s. So we've had an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of about 1 to 1, or 1, maybe 2 to 1, about equal amounts of omega-6s and omega-3s in our diet. You know, and our body's smart. It knows all about this great and not so great thing, right? So when we eat about equal amounts of omega-3s and omega-6s, this enzyme prefers omega-3s. Right? And so when you eat about equal amounts, this, um, this enzyme kind of makes omega-6s wait in line. And so you make a lot more of this stuff and less of this stuff. And that's great. But then, about 100 years ago, things started to change. Guys with names like Wesson develop all sorts of new ways to industrially produce cooking oils like cottonseed oil which are just loaded with omega-6s. Now, when you, when you start, and so over the last 100 years, we've been, our omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has been rising. We've been eating more and more foods containing things like cottonseed oil and corn oil. And so we've been really flooding our system with omega-6s. And although this enzyme does like omega-3s better, when you just swamp your body with omega-6s, this poor enzyme is overwhelmed, makes the omega-3s wait in line, and you make a lot more of this stuff and less of this stuff. And that's yeah, not so great. Well, what's not so great about this AA stuff, arachidonic acid? Well, it actually goes on in our body to produce inflammation. In fact, this is actually how aspirin works. Aspirin blocks our body's ability to produce inflammation from the omega-6s we eat in our diet. And that's why um, many health professionals would have people at high risk for heart disease take an aspirin a day. All right, so the ideal ratio, intake ratio, should ideally be less than 4 to 1. 4 omega-6s for every 1 omega-3. Now you say, wait a second. 
I thought the omega-3s were the good ones. Well, yes, indeed, but again, this enzyme prefers omega-3s, such that you can eat four times as many omega-6s and only one quarter of the amount of omega-3s, and you still make all the EPA and DHA you need, or at least that's the theory. All right, so four to one or less. Well, so if you look at the latest uh, uh, studies, uh, meat eaters, the ratio for meat eaters was about seven to one. Not so good. The ratio for... Vegetarians, though, was 10 to 1, and the ratio for vegans was 15 to 1. There was a recent study on vegan kids that found a ratio of 44 to 1, just off the charts. All right, well, where do most people get their omega-3s? Well, in this society, mostly from fish, some in poultry, a little in eggs. And not only are vegetarians not getting enough omega-3s, but it turns out in surveys that for some reason vegetarians are getting two to three times as many omega-6s as the general population. For some reason, vegetarians and vegans are just eating a lot of processed foods containing cottonseed oil and corn oil. And meat eaters can cheat. The flesh of oily fish like sardines contains preformed EPA and DHA. So fish eaters don't have to worry so much about this ratio, don't have to worry so much about this enzyme, because they're getting EPA and DHA directly into their diet. And that's why you give people fish oil capsules and their risk of heart disease drops, by, dying from heart disease drops about 30%. And that's the reason why the American Heart Association recommends one to two fatty fish flesh meals a, a week. And that's reason number one why vegetarians may not be doing as well as we should. Okay, so what's a vegetarian to do? Right. Well, how do we get our ratio down? Our ratio down to facilitate the making of this stuff and less of this stuff. Well, wait a second. Maybe if we ate more omega-3s and less omega-6s, that would work. All right, well, where do we get omega-3s from? Yes, indeed, greens and walnuts, but you would have to eat a lot of spinach salads with walnuts every day to get your omega-3s for the day. Thankfully, the most concentrated source of omega-3s on the planet is not fish, it's flax seeds. Flax seeds are one of the world's original health foods, been widely prized throughout history. Uh, Hippocrates used them. Mahatma Gandhi himself was right, and he always, when he said, Wherever flax seeds become a regular food item among the people, there will be better health. He actually did say that. Um, for more up-to-date reference, uh, the alternative medicine guru, Dr. Andrew Weil, has stated that if you just make a single change to your diet, if you can just make one change to your diet, it should be to add flax seeds to your diet. Right? So, well, how do you eat them? Well, you go to your natural food store or like Green Star Co-op production. For, uh, and you can find them in the bulk section for 99 cents a pound. There are golden ones and brown ones. Nutritionally, they're identical, so pick your favorite color. Flax seeds come in nature's finest packaging, the hard natural hole, which keeps them fresh, such that you, can keep, you don't even have to refrigerate them. You can keep them on your kitchen counter in an airtight container for a year, and they do just fine. Unfortunately, nature's finest packaging is just a little too good, such that if you eat the whole seed, it just kind of comes out the other end, doesn't do you any good. So, you need to grind them up. So, spice grinder, coffee grinder, food processor, good blender will do it. You can actually buy at Green Star Cooperative Market. Pre-ground flax seeds for $3 a pound, but a pound will last you for months. How much of this stuff do you actually have to eat? Um, well, uh, recommendations keep changing. The NIH disagrees with the World Health Organization, disagrees with Europe, but I think the research points to everyone eating one to two tablespoons of ground flax seeds every day of your life until you die. And that's about equivalent to American Heart Association's one to two fatty fish flesh meals a week. Now, and once, they are, once you do grind it, then you do have to put it in the refrigerator. But ground flax seeds last for months um, in the refrigerator, although it should not last for months because you're going to eat it every day. Um, what do you do with this stuff? Well, it's a, ground flax seeds, a light nutty powder. You can do it. You can sprinkle it on your oatmeal or whatever you're eating throughout the day. 
Um, you can bake with it. You can make muffins, breads, all sorts of things with it. My current favorite is smoothies, though. You take two tablespoons of flax seeds, grind them up, and then you know half a frozen banana, some frozen blueberries, and some nice organic soy milk. Oh, the, the flax seeds have this real binding quality, such that you get these really thick, milkshaky smoothies. In fact, because of that binding quality, you can actually use ground flax seeds to replace eggs in baking. You take one tablespoon of ground flax seeds, mix it up with three tablespoons of water, and then you mix it up to it's all frothy, gooey, snotty, and that replaces one egg in baking. That's actually the preferred egg replacer of my favorite vegan cookbook author, Joanne Stepanek, if I can give away her, all her secrets. Yes? They do not, and that's the amazing thing about ground flax seeds. You can bake them 350 degrees for an hour, and it doesn't hurt the omega-3 content at all, which is quite surprising. However, that's not the case with the flaxseed oil. And the reason I don't recommend the flaxseed oil is it's more expensive, it goes rancid, even, it won't last even a few weeks in the fridge. Um, it tastes kind of nasty, and you can't cook with it. You can't even heat it up for a few seconds because it destroys the omega-3s. But somehow, the way nature intended in the seed, you can grind the flax seeds up, bake them all you want. It doesn't hurt the omega-3s, but when you extract out the oil, it, the omega-3s are very unstable. So you have to use it in like a salad dressing or something uncooked. Um, but I think, but the reason why I strongly recommend the ground flax seeds instead of the flaxseed oil is because you're missing out on all the other wonderful nutrients that are found in the flaxseed. Flaxseeds are also a wonderful source of soluble fiber and boron, these wonderful phytoesterins called lignans, anti-tumor, anti-inflammatory, um, anti-cancer properties, just amazing things which you miss when you just um, um, take out the oil. Any way you cut it, flax seeds I think are really the best way to get your omega-3s in many ways better than getting them from fish. To spite you for murdering them, fishies load up your body with toxic heavy metals like lead and mercury and DDT and PCBs. In fact, concerns over mental retardation and birth defects have led the FDA and the EPA to recommend that pregnant, breastfeeding women and small children limit their intake of fish in this country. Uh, fish is a real food disaster from a food safety point of view. It can spread everything from hepatitis to cholera. Certainly, overfishing is a global environmental disaster, not to mention the poor fishy. So, when a fish-eating woman comes into my office, I've just got to hold up my hand and say, just a flax, man. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now if you look at the diagram, you see that's really only half the story. Yes, we have to increase our omega-3s, but we also have to decrease our omega-6s. Thankfully, that's totally easy. All we have to do is we go home tonight and if we have any of the following oils, if you have any of the following oils in your house, cottonseed oil, corn oil, safflower oil, or sunflower oil, you are in need of an oil chain. You should throw them the hell out. And instead, if you use oils in your baking which, and cooking, which you don't have to, but if you do use oils, what oil should you use instead? There we go. Olive oils, the monounsaturated oils, the single best oil is olive. Um, but it does have a distinctive taste, which may not be appropriate for all your cooking needs. And so canola oil, particularly I recommend organic canola oil because of the GMO issue, um, is second choice. Okay, so anyway, back to that Lyon diet heart trial. Well, how did they decrease their ratio from 20 down to 4, exactly where we want it? Remember 4 to 1? All they did is they sat down with everyone at the beginning of the study for half an hour and said, look, go home, whatever fats and oils you have in your house, throw them away and replace it with olive and canola. That's all they did, and wham, 20 down to 4, right, exactly where we want it. So, see, now, we could do that, right? Now, see, they didn't have to eat flax because both sides were eating fish, but imagine what we did, we could do if we took our flax, got rid of the oils on top of our cholesterol levels. Remember, they had 7% drop, and they had miserable cholesterol levels, right? We are just going to blow them away. All right. Um, Going back to here, you'll see, you know, if we have a lot of omega-6s in our diet and not a lot of omega-3s, it might lead to more inflammation in our body. And that's why a lot of people with inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, etc., actually take like flaxseed oil therapeutically in large doses to, to kind of tip their balance over to the non-inflammatory side. And indeed, you know, we're finding more and more diseases tend to have an inflammatory component to them. Diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, studies suggest that those people who were taking chronic aspirin long term for whatever reason had five times less Alzheimer's disease. Right? 
Now, no one should take chronic aspirin long term without a prescription, I think. But what we can do is, again, we can tip the balance over to the non-inflammatory side, eating more omega-3s, less omega-6s. So am I saying that the same dietary change that's going to decrease our risk of heart disease is also going to decrease our risk of, heart, of uh, Alzheimer's as well? Yes, indeed. All right, so we have explored the first reason why vegetarians aren't living up to our potential, or more actively kind of out to our potential. Reason number two is probably even more important. Let's go back to this uh, heart disease uh, flow chart here. You know, as vegetarians and vegans, we are blocking this step, the buildup of oxidized cholesterol. So if we, as vegetarians and vegans, take our flax, get rid of those oils, we are going to be blocking heart disease at every turn. Here, 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 here. Well, yeah, every turn except here. Wouldn't it be cool if there's some way we could block this whole deadly cascade in the first place? Reason number two is homocysteine. The homocysteine story started in 1968 when a Boston pathologist by the name of Colin McCauley saw these two kids. It's always bad when pathologists see people because that means they're dead. An eight-year-old boy and a two-month-old infant both died of massive strokes. Turns out they both had a genetic defect which led to abnormally high levels of this toxic metabolite called homocysteine, which led to these damaged cholesterol-clogged arteries in these little kids. And, you know, Dr. McCauley sat down and said, you know, I wonder if this homocysteine stuff has some role to play in adult heart disease as well. Well, he, you know, like many brilliant discoveries in the medical field, he was laughed at and ridiculed for years, but now we know. Now we know that homocysteine is a vasculotoxin, meaning it directly damages our blood, blood vessels. Even moderately elevated levels of this toxic substance have been just been shown to be a setup for heart disease. Right. So now the goal is to have a homocysteine level under 10. This is just micromoles per liter. It's kind of how we measure it. Um, again, this is a toxic substance, so we want low levels in our blood. And so if you look at data from 2001, for example, meat eaters have an average, average homocysteine level of 12. Not so good. But ovo-lacto-vegetarians had an homo average homocysteine level of 16. And vegans, 19. Houston, we have a problem. Seems that people with homocysteine levels as high as 16 are at threefold risk of dying from a heart attack. It's been estimated that if we just had a five-point drop in homocysteine levels in this country, we would save the lives of 56,000 Americans every year. And as bad as vegetarians have it, there seems to be an epidemic of the so-called hyperhomocysteinemia, or too much homocysteine, in the blood of vegans. And it's not just a vasculotoxin, it's a neurotoxin as well. It kills brain cells. People with homocysteine levels over 14 are four times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And so this homocysteine is where we think the bulk of the blunting of our heart disease benefit comes from. This homocysteine is also where we think th that our increased rates of degenerative brain disease come from as well. Um, um, because of our dangerously high levels of homocysteine. And the same thing with heart disease. Yes, we have less oxidized cholesterol, but we have so much more in this initial entry that it's canceling out our benefits. All right? Homocysteine is not just a vasculotoxin and a neurotoxin, though. It's been linked to stroke risk, age-related hearing loss, birth defects, miscarriages, blood clots, cognitive decline, depression, the list goes on and on. And you know, this is data from 2001. We've got new data now. 2002, new study came out. You know, meat eaters were stuck up at 12. Not so hot. Vegetarians, ovo-lacto-vegetarians, had an average homocysteine level of 17, though, and vegans, 27. Oof. All right. So, two questions, right? One, why the heck are we so high? And two, how the heck do we get rid of it? Well, 
Homocysteine is a natural byproduct of amino acid metabolism, meaning it builds up in every single person every single day on this earth, and our body has three ways by which, by which it gets rid of this stuff, three pathways by which it neutralizes this toxic substance into less harmful substrates. Pathway number one involves a vitamin called vitamin B6. Pathway number two involves a dietary component called choline. And you know, pathway three actually uses two vitamins. One's called folic acid or folate, and the other is called vitamin B12. Pretty much everyone gets enough vitamin B6. It's found widely through animal and plant food. Same thing with choline, found widely through the animal and plant kingdom. But you know, folate is found almost exclusively in plant foods, and this vitamin B12, as many of you know, is found almost exclusively in animal-derived foods. This, folate, is the reason why meat eaters are stuck up at 12, right? They're just not eating enough fruits and vegetables, not getting enough folic acid. But this, vitamin B12, is the reason we have such terrible rates of hyperhomocysteinemia, or we have such dangerous levels of homocysteine. More and more evidence is accumulating that we, vegetarians and vegans, are just not getting enough vitamin B12 to adequately lower our homocysteine levels. And it turns out for vegans, some vegans aren't even getting enough B12 to avoid the classic B12 deficiency disease. Right? It used to be thought, ah, you don't need to worry about your B12 because you need so little and, and you know, it's kind of on everything and you store it up for years. What's the big deal? Severe irreversible brain damage. That's the big deal. <laughs> well, what, what about herbivores like gorillas, right? They don't take no B12. They seem to be doing pretty good. Well, they also eat bugs, dirt, and feces. <laughs> if you also want to eat bugs, dirt, you may also not have to worry about your B12. But if, for whatever reason, you choose not to, you need to get your B12, contrary to popular vegan myth, clinical B12 deficiency, meaning symptomatic B12 deficiency, is not uncommon. And I will spare you the gruesome scare stories of the vegans that have died, went blind, were paralyzed because of not enough B12. I mean, do we want articles in the medical literature published with titles like subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord in a 14-year-old due to a strict vegan diet? This poor vegan kid in Philly got paralyzed, right? Even one of these is way too many, right? So the evidence is perfectly clear. You either eat B12 fortified foods or take B12 supplements. Right? Well, I don't need fortified foods there, partner, because I get, I get all the B12 I need from, from fermented foods like tempeh and miso and sea vegetables. No, you don't. It used to be thought that lots of plant foods had B12 in it, but actually we were using a faulty test. We were using a test that didn't differentiate between active B12 and these so-called inactive B12 analogs, which look like B12 to the test, but actually unusable by our body. So it actually, if we do take in these, this B, these B12 analogs, it may actually kind of clog up our B12 machinery and act as anti-B12. Wait a second, can't I just go into my organic backyard garden and kind of pull up a carrot and not scrub all the dirt off? If I may turn your attention to one of the most prestigious sources of vegetarian nutrition, I was the Vegetarian Nutrition and Health Letter out of Loma Linda University. March 2002, they had a great article called The 10 Most Common Myths About Vegetarian Diets, and myth number one was, drum roll please, <laughs> vegetables grown in B12 rich soil can meet vitamin B12 needs. It's a myth. It's not true. OK, so I'll get into the nitty gritty exactly how we should get our B12 in just one moment. I cannot help but mention one last study. The results from a really landmark study were released last year at the Congress by this Australian researcher who took all these vegetarians who had low B12 levels and had them fill out a well-being questionnaire, kind of how you're feeling, how you're doing, what's your mood, and then gave them B12 for a couple months, and then have them come back, fill out the survey again, and found that those whose B12 levels rose had highly significant improvements in well-being compared to like the sugar pill group. Right? So, um, and they felt better. They just had more reserve energy. In fact, my favorite anecdote is from Alex Hershef. He's the president of Farm, uh, founded Meat Out Day, president of the Animal Rights Conferences. He uh, 
told me he was feeling tired and sluggish. Then he took his B12 and he was like, wham, in his words, quote, the effect was almost immediate and remarkable. My stamina and energy level are up and I feel middle-aged again instead of a tired old man. So take your B12. Odds are you'll feel better. Right? Your homocysteine levels will go down and you'll reduce your risk of getting paralyzed, demented, and dead. All for just pennies a day. You cannot get too much B12. Um, you just kind of get expensive urine. Um, so you, there, you cannot take too much B12. Now your body can only absorb a certain amount, so you can't just go a couple months and take a whole bottle, right? But um, you need a regular reliable source. But no, you cannot get too much B12. You just kind of excrete it out. And no, in fact, pregnant women really need to get B12 because they're getting B12 for two. What about lacto-ovos? Well, ovo-lacto-vegetarians, those who eat eggs and dairy regularly, probably get enough B12 to avoid the outright B12 deficiency disease, but aren't getting enough B12 to adequately lower their homocysteine levels. It's kind of like vitamin C and scurvy. To avoid scurvy, the vitamin C deficiency disease, you just need like six milligrams of vitamin C a day. It's like nothing, right? Now, but if you actually want a functioning immune system and all the other wonderful things that vitamin C in foods does, well, you need it like 10 times that, like 60 or 100 milligrams a day. See, that which you need to avoid deficiency is not necessarily what you need for optimum health. The same thing with vitamin B12. About 25% of all ovo vegetarians have a functional B12 deficiency, meaning their homocysteine levels are just too high. And that figure may be more like 80% for vegans who've been vegan for two or more years. So B12 deficiency is actually not uncommon at all in the vegetarian community, but it needn't be so. Right? Nothing's written in stone. All we need to do is get our B12. And, there was, and the studies have um, already been published. You take a whole bunch of vegetarians and vegans, you give them B12, and wham! Their homocysteine levels drop like a rock down to eight. Not up at 12? No. The only reason the meat eaters are stuck up at 12 is because they're not eating enough fruits and vegetables, right? But we can take advantage of our folate intake, right? And as soon as we get our B12, wham, down to 8, down into the safety zone. Right. And meat eaters are catching on. This, uh, in a recent study called Vegan Diet-Based Lifestyle Program Rapidly Lowers Homocysteine Levels. They took these vegans, I'm mean, sorry, excuse me, they took these meat eaters, put them on a vegan diet for one week. One freaking week! And found that those of the highest homocysteine levels had their homocysteine levels drop by over 20%, right? The vegan diet is like magic. But now these were meat eaters, so they're like B12 coming out their ears, right? I mean, but, uh, and so but all they need was some fruits and vegetables to bring their homocysteine levels down. But imagine what we could do. We get our flax, get rid of those oils, take our B12 on top of our cholesterol levels, our, our blood pressure and all that. We are just going to walk all over. All right. So what we need to do to fight homocysteine, vitamin B12 in fortified, B12 fortified foods or supplements. If you want to do supplements, there's kind of two ways you can do them, weekly or daily. Probably the simplest method is to chew up one B12 tablet containing 2,000 micrograms or more once a week. So you can go down to Green Star Co-op and get these 5,000 microgram tablets. And so you can cut them in half and just take one half of one of those pills once a week. Share a bottle with your friends. Comes out to be about five bucks a year. Pick a day of the week. You know, I know my B12 day is Monday. I know every Monday I gotta update the Mad Cow page, take my B12. You know, it's kind of part of my life. You know, that's what. Um, B12 is indeed water soluble. So it's stable. You can take it once in a week, and that's enough. Um, you can, uh, if you take high enough doses, you can take once a week because your liver actually stores it up. Although you can certainly, if you don't like to take, if it's hard for you to remember to take something once a week and rather get in the habit of taking something once a day, then you have to take much less, 100 micrograms once a day. So if you have a multivitamin or something you take once a day, you should check to see if it has 100 micrograms or more of vitamin B12. And all B12, thank you for that question, all B12 in supplements and fortified foods is vegan. It's bacteria derived. It's all, they, they just put it in a stainless steel, sta stainless steel tank. None of it is animal derived. It's just too expensive. So having said that, some of the other filler ingredients might not be vegetarian. It might have gelatin in the capsule or something. Right. But, but the B12 itself is vegan. 
All right, now for those of you who don't like taking supplements, well, you can get all the vitamin B12 you need by eating forti B12 fortified foods. The only thing you have to remember is if you rely exclusively on B12 fortified foods, you need to get at least two servings a day, separated by like six hours. So if in the morning you have a cup of B12 fortified soy milk, then you know in the afternoon or, or evening you can have something else with, with B12, like a teaspoon of the Red Star Vegetarian Support Formula Nutritional Yeast, or a lot of the you know, fake meats and, and, and you know, rice milks and, and soy milks and um, breakfast cereals, cornflakes, raisin bran, grape nuts. I mean, they all have vitamin B12 in them. You just have to read your labels. Um, what about ovolactose? How much B12 is in the eggs and dairy? Well, you would have to eat like five eggs a day or three glasses of milk. That's an awful lot of saturated fat and cholesterol. Certainly would not recommend that. Um, okay, um, I don't seem, do you have those, did you come in with a stack of, oh there they are back here. I don't seem to have time to cover some of the other things like osteoporosis or chromium, copper, iron, iodine, magnesium, riboflame, selenium, or zinc, so I typed up all my cut to the chase recommendations um, and we will pass them out as we speak and run through them before I conclude and take questions. All right, that will be, um, as that's going around the room, um, Dr. Michael Clapper, in part based on his vegan health study, describes the status of minerals in the diets of many vegetarians and vegans as underappreciated, underconsumed, and underabsorbed. Right? If you'd like to read what Dr. Clapper says about uh, the mineral status, our mineral status, I encourage everyone to read this very important article, which is found online on the bottom of that. You'll see it on your handout when you get it. Or, of course, if you don't have internet access, you can use the library, although it's probably only open for about two minutes. We'll hear the ding. Um, or you can, of course, read it up here. I have its um, copy up here. All right, uh, everyone, almost everyone have it. Let's start at the top here. Vitamin B12 and omega-3s, we've talked about that. Fortunately, I didn't get to talk about all this juicy stuff about DHA. Suffice to say, if you um, are even contemplating um, getting pregnant or are diabetic, you should take 300 milligrams of DHA every day such that your baby gets it from months before, ideally months before conception throughout weaning. And there are vegetarian, vegan sources in veggie caps available. I, it may actually be reasonable for all non-fish eaters to take DHA. It is an unanswered research question at this point. That is in addition to flaxseed for diabetics and pregnant and breastfeeding moms. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and, maybe, and maybe appropriate for everyone. That's an unanswered question. Next, get, everyone have the copy? Get your vitamin D. Major study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition last summer found, quote, irrefutable evidence that vitamin D deficiency is a major unrecognized epidemic in the United States. Wait a second, isn't it just a sunshine vitamin? Can't you go out and just get a little sunshine? Not in Ithaca, not during the winter. Unfortunately, during the months of January and February, the sun's rays at this latitude are at such an angle that no matter how long you sunbathe naked here in Ithaca during January and February, you are just not going to make enough vitamin D. So you need to get it into your diet. One can actually get an entire day's supply naturally uh, in a few mushrooms. Uh, shiitake mushrooms and chanterelle mushrooms actually have natural vitamin D in them, but you have to eat like a dozen mushrooms a day. Certainly there's a lot of vitamin D fortified foods like the um, soy milks and rice milks and other motherless milks out there, um, as well as bre fortified breakfast cereals may come in handy here. And if you're not pasty white or don't want to die of skin cancer, so correctly use sunscreen, or you're young or you're old, or if you own a cable modem or don't get outside for whatever reason, you may want to take vitamin D in your diet year round and not just during the winter. How much? Okay. Um, and so for vitamin D, the current recommendation is 200 international units a day um, for up to age 50, um, 450 to 70, and over age 70, um, 600 international units, although all of those are probably going up. So probably. Um, everyone um, needs a minimum of 400 international units, although the Institute of Medicine hasn't ruled on that yet. All right, next, 700 to 1,000 milligrams a day of calcium? Wait a second. 
I thought we didn't eat all that calcium because we don't eat all that calcium leaching animal protein, right? Well, if I may point you back to the 10 most common myths about vegetarian diets, and this article is a full, full text online. You can see it, the URL is um, on the bottom of that handout. And myth number two is vegetarians need less calcium than meat eaters. It's a myth. It's not true. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about of calcium, although I certainly can do it in question and answer. I would refer everyone to this very important article written by Ginny Messina called Hip Fracture Rates and Vegan Calcium Needs. And again, that article is online or up here. So, are you eating three cups of kale a day? <laughs> three cups of bok choy, three cups of collards? Well, you should. That's how everyone should get their um, calcium or drinking three cups of calcium fortified soy milk or three cups of calcium fortified orange juice. You know, if you're not, you're probably not getting your recommended daily intake of calcium. So you may want to take a calcium supplement. I'd be happy to um, talk about calcium supplements if um, people are interested at the end. Now you could drink the milk from a cow, but nutritionally, cow's milk is not the best source of calcium. It doesn't have lots of the wonderful things that dark green leafies have that are very important for your bone health, like vitamin K and boron and vitamin C, all important for bone health, but missing in dairy milk. Um, and, it, and dark leafy greens don't have a lot of things that you don't want, like the saturated fat and cholesterol and antibiotics and hormones and pus and all those other things that we don't want in milk, and retinol. Vitamin A palmitate, this animal-derived vitamin A that's added to the low-fat milk supply and is thought to critically weaken people's bones. That's why in the Harvard Nurses Study, which looked at over 68,000 women, found that those who drank the most milk had the most fractures. And the reason they think is because the low-fat milk, they were all health conscious, so drinking low-fat milk, right, because they didn't want to die of heart, heart disease, drinking low-fat milk, and low-fat milk has this vitamin A palmitate or retinol added to it, and it's thought to interfere with bone metabolism. Um, and that's why we think these seven-day Adventist vegetarians out in California were breaking their hips so often, because they were all health conscious and drinking lots of low-fat milk, and that was weakening their bones. We won't know that until the, it's actually published, but... That's the leading hypothesis at the moment. Iodine. Alarming rates of iodine deficiency have been found among British vegans because they don't iodize salt over there. Now, the British milk drinkers were protected because they use iodine-containing disinfectants to disinfect the milk processing tanks and kind of leaches into the milk. It's kind of gross. But low iodine intake can lead to hypothyroidism, which can lead to high cholesterol and high homocysteine. So, if you don't use iodized salt or eat sea vegetables, right, or drink milk, you need to get iodine from somewhere. Um, and so you may want to take a supplement or, or eat some, uh, um, some sea vegetables. You know, if you're one of those that uses natural sea salt, don't. If you use table salt, it's not a good idea for your health, but if you use table salt, you should use iodized table salt. It's a convenient way to get your iodine. And the best article I've seen to date on this is this written by Stephen Walsh in the Vegan Society. Um, and so, again, this iodine article is available online and up here as well. Iron. Given the new RDAs in the United States, it would seem the only way a vegetarian woman could get enough iron is to eat rusty nails every day. And indeed, 9 out of the 10 studies done on Western vegetarians have found that vegetarians are more likely to be iron depleted, have lower iron stores, but we don't seem to have lower rate, higher rates of iron deficiency anemia. And that's really what we're worried about. But just because vegetarian women don't have higher rates of iron deficiency anemia than meat eaters doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot because meat eaters have such crappy rates in the first place. Basically, 1 in 20 menstruating women in this country have iron deficiency anemia, which is a serious disease. So... Vegetarian women, eat your beans, greens, grains, and nuts, and eat vitamin C-rich foods with your meals, which enhances iron absorption, as well as getting yourself screened for anemia every year or every few years, like when you get your pap. And men shouldn't do anything unless first being tested for an iron overload disease called hemochromatosis. If you think you're anemic, you should really get tested. I don't think anyone should just take iron supplements without a prescription. Selenium. Works as an important cancer-fighting antioxidant. 
A problem for northern European vegetarians because they have selenium deficient soil. Not a problem for North American vegetarians, but if anyone has any British, Belgian, Swedish, or Slovakian vegetarian friends, you may want to tell them to eat some Brazil nuts every month. All right, not a day should go by without everyone eating greens, beans, nuts, whole grains, and fresh fruit. All right, so what's so good about greens? What's not? good about greens. It's the healthiest single thing that we can possibly eat. Right? Uh, eating just one serving of dark leafy greens or broccoli every day and you cut your risk of hip fracture in half. Right? I am just in awe of greens. You should eat them every day. Right? While we're on the subject of best and worst, the greens are the best thing we can eat, anyone know what the most toxic or dangerous food or food ingredient in our current food supply is? What's the worst? Sugar is bad, but there's worse. Soda is bad, but there's worse. Coffee? Yeah, a lot of coffee is bad, but there's worse. Shout it out. Salt's not good, but there's worse. Saturated fat is bad, right? Bad. But there's worse. White flour is bad, but there's worse. <laughs> Corn oil is no good for you, but there's worse. This cannot be the first audience. I've been on the road 11 months. Come on. Not to, I don't want to breathe. All right. What? <laughs> Plutonium. Tr trans fats. Hydrogenated oils. All right. Trans fats are, these toxic trans fats are found only one place in nature, animal fats. All animal fats contain these toxic trans fats. But thanks to better living through chemistry, the food industry found a way to synthetically create these toxic fats by hardening vegetable oil in a process called hydrogenation, which rearranges their atoms and makes them act more like animal fats. And the National, so there's you know, good fats, there are bad fats, then there are killer fats, and those are these trans fats. The National Academy of Science just a few months ago concluded, had this damning, published this damning report on trans fats and said the only safe intake is zero. That the upper limit tolerable intake daily is zero. Now wait a second. If the National Academy of Science is saying the only safe intake is zero, and it's only found in animal foods and processed foods. Are they telling everyone to go vegetarian? Right, that makes sense. Well, you know, actually they didn't. So they were challenged on it, and a, um, one of the authors of the report responded to the challenge, a nutritional epidemiologist at the Harvard School of Public Health, responded to the challenge, and he said, quote, we can't tell people to stop eating all meat and all dairy products, he said. Well, we could tell people to become vegetarians, he added. If we were truly basing this only on science, we would, but it is a bit extreme. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't want scientists to base anything on science, would we? Oh. I just had to get that out. All right. What's so good about beans? A uh, study just came out. Those who ate legumes, beans, peas, or lentils, four times a week or more, had 20% less heart disease. All right. Beans, beans are good for your heart. The more you eat, the more. Right. Um, those who ate nuts at least five times a week had half the mortality rates, half the cardiac mortality, those who ate five servings of nuts or more a week. And for those of you who are like, oh, I don't want to eat nuts because they're going to make me fat. Actually, there's an impressive body of research to suggest that those people who add nuts to their diet, if anything, actually lose weight. And we're not sure why, whether it satiates the appetite or actually causes you to excrete more fat in your feces. We're not sure why. But bottom line, nuts will not make you fat. You should eat them every day. All right. Um, what kind of nuts? Um, basically, any nuts except coconuts and chestnuts. So, uh, hmm? and peanuts, although they're technically legumes, have a nutritional profile which closely resembles other nuts. And so again, any nuts, nut butters, cashew butter, almond butter, there's some nuts that are a little better than other ones, but basically nuts are nuts, and, but I could go specifically down to a, 
a list of better and worse later on. Uh, next, studies also consistently show that even health conscious vegetarians don't eat the recommended minimum uh, number of servings of fruits and vegetables every day, which is? Oh, not bad, right? Five a day, I heard five a day saying, you know, five a day, that was a few months ago. But the front row knows, right? The National Cancer Institute just a few months up to nine a day, minimum, right? Nine, so you thought you weren't doing so good before, now you're really behind, right? <laughs> That's the minimum. So 9 a day, 10 a day, 12 a day, as many fruits and vegetables as you can possibly stuff in your face. All right. All right. Next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drink lots of water. No, seriously. Seventh-day Adventist study um, presented to the Congress last year. Vegetarian or not, those that drank five glasses of water every day had half the cardiac mortality, half the fatal stroke rate. What? Yeah, you don't eat meat, nothing happens. You eat some nuts, drink some water, you have your mortality rates? Absolutely amazing, right? While we're on the subject, is there anything else I can just kind of down and dirty have your mortality rate? Well, uh, take the, in the German vegan study, for example, they found out that those who were, quote unquote, who, surprise, surprise, physically active, had half the mortality rates of those couch potatoes or computer potatoes or whatever the case may be. And maybe get your cholesterol checked. Who knows what your cholesterol is? Oh, everybody should know what their cholesterol is. The current recommendation is everyone starting at age 20 should get their cholesterol checked and get it rechecked every five years. And quit smoking. Cigarettes slice at least like eight years off your life. All right, last but not least, Z is for zinc. I didn't mention anything specifically about zinc on there because once again, greens, beans, nuts, and whole grains to the rescue. Vegetarians, though, are prone to low body zinc pools, however. Um, uh, inadequate zinc intake can impair one's immunity, impair one's taste sensation, and impair one's appetite. Serious deficiency can lead to growth stunting or small testicles. No one's actually gone around and measured the size of vegetarian testicles, but there was a, no, but there was a taste acuity study that found that vegetarians couldn't taste as well as meat eaters. Now, I've kissed a few and I think vegetarians taste pretty good, but no indeed we should think about zinc. And while I'm being risque, especially men, since we lose like 20% of our RDA for zinc in every seminal emission, that's a good half cup of nuts right there. So, <laughs> I'm serious. Beans, particularly sprouted or fermented, like tempeh and miso. Nuts and seeds, again, dry roasted or sprouted, are good sources. And again, fortified breakfast cereals may come in handy here as well. All right. My final words. You know, when I first learned about this stuff, you know, my first thought was like, it just doesn't seem natural, right? All these pills and weird oils and stuff. I mean, like, when human beings were evolving, they didn't take no calcium supplements, right? Well, you know, then I looked at that. I mean, they certainly weren't getting it from milk. Prehistoric peoples got all the calcium they needed from eating wild plants, like nettles, which are just loaded with calcium. Um, it's, it's estimated that prehistoric peoples got 2,000 milligrams of calcium every single day eating wild plants, right? That's three times what milk drinkers get in this country, right? But we just don't eat those kind of plants anymore because of the way we live in our modern world, right? And cavemen didn't have to take no flax, right? Well, again, that's because their ratio was one to one. There's no such thing as trans fats, no such thing as cotton seed oil, right? And, interestingly, many of the wild plants have higher omega-3 contents than the cultivated ones. So, for example, purslane, the most common plant in the world, um, is dug up here as a weed, but everywhere else they eat it because it's so good for you, is one of the highest plant omega-3 contents in the world. You know, but we don't eat weeds anymore. We eat iceberg lettuce, right? And they didn't have to take no vitamin D. That's because they lived and worked outside. That's because they could work outside because there wasn't a big hole in the ozone layer. You know, there weren't these smog-ridden cities and all that, you know. And they didn't have to take no B12. Well, you know, we used to be able to get all the B12 we needed from the water we drank. You know, drinking out of a mountain stream or well water, you know. But we don't get a lot of B12 anymore in our water because we chlorinate our water supply to kill off all the bacteria, right? So we don't get a lot of vitamin B12 in our water anymore we don't get a lot of cholera either, right? So that's a good thing, right? But the you know, bottom line is that we live in an unnatural world, which is compromising our health, compromising our vegetarian potential. 
but we can reclaim that potential with but a few simple changes and live a long life in optimum health. Thank you. Um, the question was, well, wait a second, can you just, I mean, it does have to be five glasses of liquid a day or can it, does it specifically water? What about tea and juice? Um, this study, so we, the, the answer is we don't know. This study asked specifically glasses of water or glasses of non-water, right? And it found out that those that drank five glasses of water had half the mortality rates, but those that drank other liquids other than water, that big category, actually had increased mortality rates. Probably because they, you know, they were drinking soda and milk and some other things, right? Um, so basically, we don't know. I would assume that herbal tea um, would, I mean, is equivalent to water. I mean, that just makes sense to me. But, but I mean, that's an unanswered research question. We really don't know. What about soy? Um, soy has been um, eaten happily by entire civilizations for thousands of years. Soy is thought to reduce one's risk of heart disease reduce one's risk of osteoporosis, and reduce one's risk of some of the reproductive cancers, like breast cancer and prostate cancer. Right? Um, now, there has been some, some kind of critical um, studies come out against soy. Most of them, however, are based on laboratory animal data. For example, their study, there was this recent study that found that infant rats don't grow so well on soy milk or, um, or on um, soy formula. Yeah, but infant rats don't grow well on human breast milk either. So that means we shouldn't give babies breast milk. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? They're freaking rats, right? Um, so, um, and so, on, so I give very little credence to that kind of, to that kind of work. Now, the, there's only really one disturbing human study um, period, and that's the Honolulu Heart Study, which was a good study. It took thousands of people, followed them out for decades, and did find that those who ate um, tofu in midlife actually had accelerated cognitive decline later in life. So we're not talking Alzheimer's or dementia, but actually the people did, um, the, did like word puzzles and stuff as if they were three years older. So the 70-year-olds actually completed tests like they were 73 if they happened to eat tofu.